Thanks, Eric. Yeah, it was uh, it was another an event to part on my. My wife called me and she's like, you should maybe come home because I'm literally in the hospital having a baby. <laughs> cool. She was early. It was hectic. Ruby, no, that's her name. Um, hi, Denver. We're going to look at a bunch of SVG stuff. This is my privilege and honor to talk about SVG. I absolutely love it. One of my favorite things to talk about. Hence the high five, I guess. Uh, I use it all the time. It's just part of my regular day-to-day -to -day toolbox of things that I use. And it's not because I have some like special job where I'm like a vector graphics nerd or anything. It just like I just like jammed it into my toolbox <laughs> over the last few years, and now it comes up all the time that I need it. It's just a natural part of my workflow, which I uh, uh, I like now. And we're gonna make it part of yours. By God. I'm gonna grab this clicker thing. So we got to do a little uh, 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 intro stuff, not not because the talk necessarily needs it, because you need it. <laughs> we're we're going to define what SVG is, because part of that, like my forcing it into your workflow, is for you to like totally get it, so that yeah, I feel like that works for some people. If you like firmly understand the tech and like where it fits into the holes that maybe you'll reach for it just because you know it's the right peg for that hole or whatever. SVG is uh, one way that you can use it is just just like you, you need to know nothing about SVG other than it's an image format in the same way that you might use a JPEG, a GIF, or a PNG, or any fancy new format or whatever, how you can just use image source whatever and drop it there and work. It totally works that way too. Or it could be a background image in your CSS. That's one way that you can use SVG and it's still vector. That's like the big differentiating thing of the SVG format is it's vector, not raster. Raster is pixels, uh, right? So j like just that is kind of great. Even if you use it that way, it's still vector, it still scales like vector and that has all kinds of enormous benefits on the web. Uh, uh, uh. Scaling being the big one, right? You can make an SVG super big. It doesn't lose any quality. It's probably super small, too. A lot of the usage for vector graphics on the web is I don't know, some kind of relatively simple shape, in which case the SVG code will just be tiny, tiny weenie, which is awesome for, for, for performance. And you can scale it huge if you want to. SVG is great for that kind of thing. All of the rest of them, of the formats, JPEG, GIF, WebP, whatever, they're all pixel-based. They're all raster. They're all just grids of pixels. In fact, this is funny. I was just standing by Eric Meyer one time at a talk like this. He <laughs> wrote a program that would convert a raster image into SVG by making one by one SVG squares next to each other. It was totally absurd. But we were testing gzip. It was kind of fun. But anyway, you don't have you have no choice. If you're into vector graphics and want to take advantage of vectorness on the web, it's SVG. There's only one thing. So if you want vector, then you got to do it. The rest of them are all pixels, and they're just some of them have alpha transparency, and some of them don't. And you know, you learned a lot uh, from Yuna about about formats that way. Even the pixel or canvas is all. Uh, is all pixel-based kind of thing. You want vector, you got to use SVG. It draws everything in SVG is, is vector, and it draws it from math, geometry, really. It's full of numbers. You can open up an SVG file, see a bunch of numbers, and it's just geometric math. It's like, put the pen down here, draw a straight line over here, draw another line over here, then curve to it based on this information or whatever. There's nothing that SVG can't draw. There's no mathematical limitations to the things that can draw. and draw whatever. It's just instructions for drawing stuff. Declarative, you might say. So we covered that you can put it in an image, you know, image source equals whatever, face.svg, and it works that way. You can use it in uh, CSS as well. But there's another way that most of the rest of this talk is going to cover, which is just using it in line. You can take that SVG code and you can just put it right in HTML, and that works too, and that's a very compelling way to use SVG. Here's an example of that. There's a body tag that's just like, look, we're in HTML, and you can just take some SVG and just put it right in HTML. So there's a document, the body is a document, uh, and the SVG is like a sub-document in the HTML. And in this case, there's a view box on it which just says, <clears throat> this is another thing I was just talking with Eric about, but the idea is, you notice there's no pixels or rems or ems or any percentages or anything on that. It's just four numbers in a row. That just says, this is the coordinate system in which uh, you can draw stuff inside of me. And it really doesn't do anything. I mean, it has some side effects, but it doesn't do anything other than, than that circle below will draw itself based on that coordinate system that you just gave. Just a simple little thing about, about SVG and how it works. 
So here's an example of inline SVG, blah, 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 paragraph tag, it renders some text, and then all of a sudden there's a big chunk of inline SVG. It draws, in this case, the code pen logo, and then another paragraph tag below that. You can intermix these things. H here's some HTML, here's some e SVG, here's some HTML. Uh, perfectly fine way to use it. I wrote a book about SVG. It's actually mandatory that you buy it. Sorry, I don't know if you got that email. <laughs> Gotta do it, though. It's, um, but you know, it's from a book apart who are out there and they're giving away books too. I saw stacks of them out there. Not everybody's grabbing their free books, but there's two of them out there that, that you get. And uh, uh, I wrote one too on the, same, on the same label. And it's like, it's about o a little over a year old, which is like, why would I buy it then? Eee, a little old, isn't it? Tech books are notorious for going out of style, you know, or having a bunch of uh, uh, outdated information in them. One, a book of art books tend to not do that because they tend to be conceptual and they age a little better than your average tech book, I would say. But more importantly, what has changed in SVG in the years since I've, read, I've written it, you know? Like, what would I amend? When's V2 coming out? Uh, it isn't because nothing has happened perfectly up to date, which is fantastic for me, really, and you. You can think of it as stable. That's another, that's nice. Anyway, here's another thing that you should just lock in your brain as far as SVG goes, is that you probably already have plenty of intuition on what is vector and what is not. There's a picture of my dog shaking off. Uh, Digby, that's a JPEG. It's going to be a JPEG forever, or maybe some other exotic format for raster data or whatever, but it's like SVG's not trying to creep into that territory. It has nothing to do with that world. The Day of the Dead kind of mask stuff on the right, that's vector. It's obviously vector. So it just, you know, when you're working on websites and you come across some vector data, just be like, oh, it's vector. That's SVG land. Like, make that connection and then start the process of thinking about actually using it SVG rather than just like save as PNG, which is the thing I'm trying to avoid a little bit. So, so recap, here's some things about SVG. It's a syntax. You can like look at it. You can, un unlike a JPEG, which you have to be like Rain Man to understand if you open the, the, the code of that thing, it's not gonna happen. You can just like look at SVG. It's weird, it's not like you're gonna be able to like look at path data and be like, it's a tree. You know, like I met a guy once that said he could do that and I was kind of skeptical, but. Uh, but you can look at it, you, it has angle brackets, it has attributes, it has stuff in there, it looks like HTML, it's not HTML, it's, it's, it's SVG, but still, it's, it's familiar territory. It's vector, it's got the resolution independent thing, huge on the web. It's animatable and scriptable, uh, uh, good stuff. SVG is a wonderful animation target, because it's like, on the web, you know, I mean, you're familiar with animation, there's a bunch of rectangles, divs are rectangles, you can animate, animate them around, but it's much more fun to animate something that already has a shape to it, which is wonderful. And you know, it's just sitting in the DOM, there's a circle, that circle element, it's just sitting in the DOM, just like a div. It's not like some other scripting language that you have to learn, it's JavaScript. You can access it and touch it in the same way that you could any other HTML element, which is cool. Uh, it's made to be quite accessible, there's all kinds of accessibility stuff you can do with it, that'd be a whole other talk. Um, you know, we got Mr. Featherstone tomorrow to talk about accessibility stuff, but just let it be known. It's an accessible format. It's an open standard format, probably gonna be around a while. Browser support for it, especially for the basic stuff, is just all green all day. Good stuff. Um, Lots of software for working with it, probably software you already use. Stuff like Sketch is great at it. Lots of great JavaScript libraries to do it. Famously, stuff like D3 is, is you might not even be aware of it, but D3 is producing SVG for you. Uh, and tools like GreenSock for animating the crap out of it. In short, it's amazing. I want you to really know about it and be kind of impressed by what it can do because I, actually what I want is for you to reach for it, for it to be part of your actual workflow, that you're not just like, Save as PNG. You know, every moment like that, I'm like, mm, that was a perfect opportunity for something that should have been SVG, but isn't. Because it straight up is underused. Like if it's your mission to like gauge SV usage on the web and you just browse around and you just look, find something that looks like it probably should be vector on the web and like open up your inspector and look at it, it never is. It's like, <laughs> it's like a bummer. Anyway, but, 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 but knowledge of it is okay. Like if you ask, if we did like an informal poll right now, I, this is like my least favorite thing at talks. And it's like, everybody raise your hand if, and then there's no like way to adjust my talk. Like if one person raised their hand, I'd be like, oh crap. Uh, well, I'm gonna give the same talk anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So awareness is pretty good. Like it's pretty high. This is, this is, but the actual usage is low. So that's the thing we're trying to fight here a little bit. It's a little higher, especially at an event like this, where you're all web heroes already. Uh, but but you know, I don't know. Kind of kind of behind the scenes is that I've gotten to give this talk a couple of times, and it's gone up not because of my talk necessarily, but there's just some momentum in SVG uh, that is kind of good. And I think next year I'm going to talk about something else. I'll have some some other kind of topic there, but. But I'd like to see that. The awareness is going up. I'd like to see the usage generally kind of come up with it a little bit. Because of the, it's really the muscle memory thing. That's my favorite thing. Is all day, like all your work day, is just like a stitching together of things that you've done a bunch of times. You're just like, no, oh, this is the keyboard command I use to make a new folder. And this is the software I use when I need to, and this is the thing I use to pull down new resources that I need. You just, you know, people get, they're in their ways. They like learn a way to do something and they do it over and over. And if you can, if you just start using SVG a few times, I remember what it was like before it was part of my workflow. And now it is part of my workflow and it just took doing it a bunch of time to develop that muscle memory. Sometimes that muscle memory word is like a, that metaphor is lost on people a little bit, but it's a little bit like golf, you know, like I don't know if I've ever golfed, but so if I went out and golfed right now, I would, I promise I would be horrible. There's no way I'm a golf prodigy. But if I went golfing a thousand times next year somehow, if I had any time, I'd probably be better at it at the end because my brain and my muscles and my fingers and all this stuff, they'd be so used to those movements that I would just be better at it, which totally works for uh, development as well. Anyway, we're still working on the intro here. Here's something you can do with SVG. Your boss is going to love it. What if your boss is like, make the logo bigger? It's a nice design, but bigger. You're like, OK, well, we're going to have to dish the nav, because something's got to go. <laughs> and we're going to, let's blast this thing up, you know? Daniel Burke had told us, you know, doing mock-ups is our superpower as designers. Get us all talking about stuff at the same time, whatever. I'll make this thing bigger. Boom. <laughs> How you like me now? Anyway, I think that looks great, and they should consider that for the next design of the, of the website. But obviously, my point is, look, because they used an SVG there, that was a no-brainer. We didn't have to, it's not because they cut a 2,000 pixel wide PNG to fit in there. It's because it's SVG, and you can do whatever. You can totally do that. You could, you know, you get it. Versus something like this, and this is funny. The first thing I do is right-click on it, and they're like, are you a nerd? Do you use... Do you, use, do you need our logo? Because they can think. Anyway, but if I inspect it in something else and then move over to it, it'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll use scale here to bump it up. But you, it loses quality because the browser's like, bro, I do not have that many pixels. You're asking me to render something way bigger than the number of pixels you gave me. So some, some genius at some point figured out some algorithm in which to render uh, PNG or JPEG or something way bigger than, it, uh, uh, than the number of pixels it has, but it always looks like garbage. It's like a universal truth of design is like never make a raster image bigger than, uh, than the, the data you have it. You know, it's been true since the print days or whatever. Like, that's not good. It totally should have been SVG. I mean, whatever. I, I don't really care what Envision does, but you know what I mean. I even found a... Br uh, a browser plugin once for Chrome called Make the Logo Bigger, and it's a sad face. And if you click it, it finds the logo, makes it bigger, and turns into a happy face. <laughs> it's a very important plugin, I think. It doesn't do. <laughs> nice. I don't know how it, I mean, I guess it probably just looks for a class name of logo or something, but it does a pretty remarkably good job at it. Uh, and anyway, sometimes I talk to people at, at conferences like this, and they're in their, their like baby step into SVG is like, well, I got our business to like make a logo SVG, and I was like, that's awesome, high five. You got it. you you baby stepped into it, which is cool. Oh, there is no logo element in, in HTML. There's nothing unique about a logo that makes it the thing that you should use SVG first, because it's just an image. Any it could have been any other image on your website. Uh, if that's how you need to baby step into it, great. But you can take that baby step anywhere, uh, which is fine. 
It's a nice step to take, though, because worrying about pixels just sucks on the web. It's just the least, it's just, it's nice to just take something away that you used to worry about, now you don't have to worry about it because when you send SVG, you're sending the right stuff. Here's an example of that. Here's a dumb website and it has an image and it's over there and whatever, like every other website in the world. What, and it's, it's a photo of the Obamas or whatever is always the example. What, what do you put, the, well, how do you be most efficient with that? Well, there's this whole world of responsive images. And one of the ways to be responsible about how many pixels you're sending to this web page is to use responsive images, which is this, not what this talk is about, but there's source set and sizes and all this stuff. You can, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, look up responsive images. What that is is trying to save bandwidth and be an efficient and, and whatever what images you're going to send. But even if you do that, as efficient as you can be, as you, maybe you'll make three, four, or five copies of the thing, and you'll send one of those things to that blue square, and it'll download one of them, which is for sure wrong. Like you're getting closer, but it's still the wrong amount of pixels to send. So it's like, even if you're killing it and doing great things with responsive images, you're still sending the wrong number of pixels. It's so much more satisfying if you can replace them with SVG, which is always the right amount of math. <laughs> yeah, yay. Okay, so if it's so great and everybody loves it, why is it underused? Why is that my arbitrary bar so low? Uh, well, here's one of the reasons why I think it might have been. So it was that day uh, when Steve Jobs came out on stage with his black turtleneck or whatever and is like, there's so many pixels on this phone, your eyeballs can't even deal with it. There's just, it can't separate this phone from reality. It's perfect eyeball stuff. The retina display, you know, they named it after your eyeball. Anyway, that day, in, in IE8 was the browser of the world. That was the day, that, that was the predominant browser. And in fact, it had, uh, IE8 had at the time, about half of all market share of all browsers. It was kind of going down at the time, but it wasn't until, what is it, nine months later that the first version of a Microsoft browser supported SVG at all. So at the time when Retina Displays came out, and that was a bummer, there was like a Retina apocalypse. If you remember, that all your little icons looked like crap for a while until you started shipping four times the amount of pixel data to them so that your icons looked crisp again. That was kind of that <laughs> period of time in history. SVG was not there to help us. Us. SVG like failed us during this time that we needed it. When, retina, when displays starting to, more and more of them started to get high pixel density, it just wasn't something that we could reach for. It didn't start becoming part of a designer tool belt until much later because SVG was just slow to be adopted by browsers. Fast forward to today, like I said, it's Greensville all day long. It's just not something you have to worry about anymore. Browser support for the basic stuff for SVG is just absolutely everywhere. Uh, but still, I think that, that early failing of us kind of slowed its adoption. Anyway, that was a long intro to get to my first slide. <laughs> 10 things uh, you can and should do with SVG. We'll count them off one through 10. One of them is a pretty obvious one. You draw things with SVG with math. Charts and graphs are, <laughs> you know, it's math on the screen. It's Super perfect use case for it. In fact, most charts and graphs, I'd think, probably leverage in some way, whether you know it or not. Here's like a super boring pie chart. There's a super clever way you can do that uh, in SVG land, where you just kind of like make a circle, and then you can even control the stroke around it with um, uh, special values to make pie charts. It's just a tiny amount of code that's, that's great for that kind of thing. Let's jump a whole bunch up in complexity and use some kind of uh, uh, SVG charting based system kind of thing where you just feed it a bunch of configuration and data and it spits out a chart like that. Great use case for SVG if you ask me. We're seeing a bunch of lines, we're seeing a bunch of markers on those lines. Uh, what's interesting to know is this is 100% SVG. It's not like an HTML shell and then just the lines in there are SVG or anything. SVG is perfectly capable of rendering text and positioning it as well. We'll get into that a little bit later. So that's just like one big old chunk of SVG. It's a great use case for it. Uh, we could animate those lines. I said SVG is a good animation target. Sure. Send it different values. Animate it if you'd like to. Uh, we have pretty cool uh, stroke control in SVG. Notice we can change the thickness and color like we could with border in, uh, in CSS, but we can also control the, the length of the dash and the space between those dashes, just kind of a cool possibility in SVG to know about. Uh, we could animate a, a, a curved path like that. Why not? Sure. It's a lovely demo from Chris Gannon, who all of his demos feel like a little 
kind of a master class in SVG animation. Not only does it animate in, but the like those axis bars come in and kind of flash. Oh, that's a nice. <clears throat> they don't the charts don't have to be lines, of course. These are polygons. A polygon in SVG is a filled shape or a complete shape anyway. So a polyline is a straight lines that doesn't have to close. Anyway, a polygon, these are stacked on top of each other and they have a, a hover, you know, because you get, you certainly get uh, the same kind of DOM events that you would on a div or a span or whatever else. You can kind of track the mouse position and hide and show things and anything else that you might do in JavaScript. Why not do that as well? I was, <laughs> I give this talk one time right after like a data viz specialist gave a talk on picking the right chart for the data that you have. Have you seen a talk like that where they're like, they show bad examples of somebody that like used a pie chart when they should have used a bar chart or something. And then I was like, I'm pretty sure there's no use case for a floating 3D wall chart. <laughs> but it's cool, I like it. I don't know if you've seen this, Nebo's not alone in this market, but there's been a couple of these like things that combine a bunch of technologies. This is niche, it's not for everybody, but it's React uh, powered components that are built, they're like D3 charts that React builds. So if that's the kind of like world that you live in, this is pretty wonderful for it. It's like really well done, um, library with really good docs. So as we explore these docs a little bit, not only it shows you what kind of chart it is, it allows you to kind of control all that stuff, but it shows you not only what the component is and does, but then it shows you the React component, which is where you like configure the, how big you want it to be, and the colors and the labels and all that stuff. And then it shows separately the data that's being fed into it. So it's like demo, component, data. And it's just a really nice way to look at these docs, I think. And if you're building, I feel like we're still living in a time, there's probably plenty of out there that work all day in React or Angular or Vue or something. And some people are like, I never do that. I just don't have a use case. So it's almost like interesting. But this is, this is a good use case for if you're still in the like, I don't get this world of React kind of thing, imagine you're building some kind of data dashboard kind of thing. It's a perfect use case to be like, oh, I see. There's a lot of state. There's things that users would want to control, and I want to be able to piece together things, uh, components like that together. It's a great use case for React and D3 and everything. So I just, I like this, this Nebo for demoing that kind of thing to people can be an aha moment for some people. So thinking of SVG and how it's made from numbers, those numbers are really easy to manipulate. Like, look at this, this is a nice demo, that's nice, I like that, I would buy that rug. But it was built with just, uh, just you know, static. There's just some shapes and it draws some stuff. But this, does, this developer decided to wire it up to like an old school thing called that GUI, which is that thing in the upper right, which we'll see in a second. But the idea is like, you can just configure it. It's not a difficult thing to configure to say, like, this little bar controls this number in the SVG, and this bar controls this number in the SVG, and you can drag them around. That way it's giving us some control over our creation. It's not just one creation anymore. It's, it's, you've just wired up your SVG to some data, and you could, this is, like, a little bit programmatic, but you could imagine, like, making a little Frosty the Snowman or whatever, and you wired up the radius of the snowballs that make Frosty the Snowman to a little bar, and you can make them bigger or smaller, or change the color of his nose, or the position of his top hat or something. Uh, SVG is cool like that. I like the idea that you've, you've drawn something artistically, and then you can kind of wire it up to be controlled this way so that you're able to explore design a little bit better. It's tailor-made for that kind of thing. There's a button here to just randomize it, so that's what's happening there. Fun. Here's another thing SVG is uniquely good at. Like with animation, I think we're aware. You can animate, and we're told to animate uh, because of the performance of the position of things and the opacity of things and the color and the scale and stuff. But there's, we don't often think you can change the shape of something too. It's just like less common on the web a little bit. So there's a button that just animates a star to a checkbox. It's using a technology called Smile, which we're not even gonna talk about because it just doesn't have a pretty bright future and I'd rather talk about fun things a little bit. 
Uh, but here's some libraries have seen that, like, oh, the future of Smile sucks. We'll step in with JavaScript, solve every problem with Smile, and make it more performant and better overall. One of those libraries is the Greensock Animation Library, which has a plugin called Morph SVG, and this is their little trailer for it. This isn't After Effects. This isn't even a video at all. These are just like paths just sitting in the DOM being animated. It's super performant. Incredible what it's able to do. Look at that. This cape so good. That is good looking cape. Anyway, that's, that's amazing. It's just happening right in the browser. It's just some shapes. You're like, morph that to that. The API for it's incredibly simple. And in fact, I found Donald Trump's signature on Wikipedia as SVG for some reason. <laughs> and I was like, I'll just say animate that thing to that thing. <laughs> that's all you do. You just tell, animate this to that, and it was fine. I did this ad for a sponsor I had, Media Temple, that I just hovered over it. It's like, I'm not, a I'm not like an exotic motion designer. I was just like, ugh, morph that to that. <laughs> and it just did it. Like, I think that was a was cool and unique thing uh, through the GreenSock API. This uses some other library. I can't even remember what it is, but it's like cell phones through time, which is just a beautiful little demo, as it were, that you could see a, you know, accompanying some kind of post about <laughs> cell phones through time. <laughs> or something, and you could see how that would, would take uh, uh, an article to the next level kind of thing. What a, what a fun interaction, you know, with that bounce in there and all that kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of cool to see CSS getting in on this a little bit, too. I think this is Chrome only for now, but check it out. I think it's, it's pretty compelling. So maybe, uh, maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't. So there's an SVG, a path in there, and I see the D attribute? So I'm saying when you hover over the SVG, change the D attribute to this new set of path data, and then I put a transition on it, and CSS was, was happy to, to perform that more for me. So it has some limitations. It had to be the same number of points and stuff, but it's kind of cool to see that that, that required no library or framework at all. That's just happening right. Uh, through CSS, which is pretty cool. So here's another example of that. Look at how little code was required to draw these things. This is me kind of figuring out the path syntax. So see how path, 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 path down there and see how few numbers I'm passing it. They're just little 10 by 10 coordinate systems where I was learning how to draw the curves and stuff that are possible in CSS. But then I was like, well, wh why don't I change those numbers in, in CSS? I'll have, a, I'll have a hover attribute and add a transition on all of them. And now I got this kind of thing going on for all of those, with just like a few bytes of code that was possible, which I think is really cool. I think that's underexplored territory, perhaps. So speaking of taking some SVG and using it in CSS, here's another thing that you should know about. What if I want to not morph the shape of something, but I want to animate the position of something in a unique, curvy way. I want to take something and I want to follow that crazy path. And I drew that in just method draw, which is like a free SVG editor online. So I can just take the pen tool and just draw a weird path or whatever. And I can save that out. So here's the code that saved down to my computer after I drew that shape. And you can see the path there with the D attribute with a bunch of numbers in there, which draws that weird path that I just drew. I can take that and I can slap it into a CSS property called offset path, which is plops a path onto an element. It doesn't do anything by itself, but if I then animate the offset distance from 0 to 100, that element will then follow that path. So I can animate the position of something in a circle or in a, any shape that I can possibly draw, which is kind of a compelling thing they can do. If you've never heard of offset path, maybe you heard of motion path. It was motion path first, and then they changed it. Why they changed it, I can't say. People just like it better that way. So I don't think I like it better. I like motion path better, but whatever. Here's an example of that. Here's that, uh, just a little div on the page and it's zooming around like Particle Man, or whatever. I slowed it down so you can kind of see it maybe a little bit better, maybe make it a little bigger, and then you can see that it's rotating while it's happening. Uh, kind of an interesting thing. It does that automatically. It makes a little more sense if it's a little car. Because then it would be weird if it didn't do that, right? It would just, if it was just a car with his wheels always pointed down, you kind of get that rotation for free, which is neat. Uh, it would be weird if you didn't get that for free. Well, here's, an, like, here's a more practical example. I'm sure you've seen modals which like fly in from above or they have some exotic design effect to them to, that, that matches branding, whatever. So here's a way to do that that uses a path, just a simple path to come in on, which is a nice little touch for a modal, perhaps. And if I didn't do that, lock the position of it and it curved when it came in, it'd just be a little awkward. <laughs> so in this case, you can lock the position. You can have it both ways, which is great. 
Uh, here's the thing to know about. There used to be a thing called body moving. It's now called Lottie Web. Airbnb has this suite of kind of design tools. And this particular tool takes Adobe After Effects, which we don't use on the web at all. It's nothing to do with that. It's more of a video motion graphics kind of thing. And it takes that and it makes it somehow, some way into SVG. And I'm not sure like how, whatever, like production ready the code it makes is, but it's kind of cool to see that you can take After Effects and then play it on the web through SVG. And it kind of opens up some design stuff that is a little bit more like, I don't know, I have a circle and it morphed into a checkbox. Like that stuff is really cool, but the kind of creativity that something like working in After Effects opens up is wild. Like, look at this little monster. That's sweet. And that's just different than you'd expect. You know, you just don't like think in that same kind of way when you're just thinking of basic SVG shapes. So, has that unlocked anything in your brain? I hope so a little bit. I hope that that kind of thing gets you thinking and that when something like this comes up in your work, you're reaching uh, for SVG. Here's another thing. This is just a dumb C uh, SVG trick that it can do. There's no like native API for this, but here's the deal. I think it kind of got popularized for the Polygon when they did this PS4 thing like years ago. It's just a nice touch where it animates in and they're reviewing it and you know, so they had like a demo unit and they make it look kind of architectural. It was really a cool uh, uh, demo for its time. It's still cool, really. Uh, but people were interested in how they did it and they started figuring it out. So here's a, here's a, here's a like poor man's explanation of how it works. Drew a simple shape. I can put that shape, take it up, put it on the web, and I can apply CSS to it and say, the dash array is 20. So that counts for both the space in between and the dash itself. It's 20 long. Uh, I could make it 100 long if I wanted to. What if I left it 100 long, but I animated the offset of that dash? So what would happen? It would just be like that. It would just be animating around in the circle. I have that ability. But what if the dash offset wasn't a thousand or or whatever, or the, the dash array wasn't a hundred, but it was as long as the entire shape itself, you just get this. Oops. Way to ruin the like final thing. It would draw itself. It would just be offset all the way so you didn't see anything, and then it would it's just a trick. And it's 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 like combined with stuff like this. This combines movement, it combines staggered opacity, it has the line drawing, it's got all the stuff, it's fun. That's what usually the best animations are. They're not just one thing, they're combinations of lots of different things, I find anyway. And this particular trick probably makes sense when you use it and it works with the theme, like drawing a maze. It looks like the maze is building itself or trying to figure itself out. That's a nice looking demo. How about for a brand like Fitbit that's all about data and movement and tracking that movement? That's so that line drawing of the Fitbit logo itself works great for that kind of thing. So it's just used as a light touch, and then the movement of the points kind of evokes data. It's a nice touch, I think. Here's another one, just general interface animation. So it's like kind of almost expected these days that there's some kind of animation happening in your interface. I think it comes from this idea, which is that like it's hard to, like without some kind of animation, sometimes it's, it's hard in modern interfaces to understand what's happening. Like if I click this thing, like the green one appears. If it wasn't green, it would probably be hard to see, but it's a lot more obvious when like it expands into place. This has nothing to do with SVG necessarily. I mean, it could be, but that kind of two-step animation, that's clear as day what's happening right there, and it's just because a little movement happened. It's tapping into our like animal brains or whatever. These are pretty whimsical little demos, but they, they tap into that as little well, like, okay, the little radio button is sliding around. That's kind of cutesy, but it is also very clear what's happening. It changed from this value to this value. And that input, that's nicer than a native input. It tells you exactly what the dang value of it is, you know? I think that's just a, it's just nice. It's, you know, it, like I said, it's whimsical. Not all of us can pull off that kind of stuff, but it's, it's, it's I would argue, it's more clear. What about this volume slider in SVG? This is just a very obvious way how to change volume. It's a catapult. <laughs> Maybe not easier, but it's awesome. <laughs> uh, you've probably seen Code Drops. If you haven't, you should go to their site. They have just zillions of demos of great stuff like this. You can see a little line drawing happening here. 
uh, and just all kind of clever stuff. They're explaining how it happens there. You know, you draw it all at once, and then you kind of limit what's being shown any time. That site is full of great demos. Here's a demo by Rachel Smith that's using some line animations and shape morphing together. So we're starting to combine the animation possibilities of stuff like that. Love it. So cool. In fact, CodePen is just lousy with, with little demos like that. In fact, there's hundreds if not thousands of loading demos in this collection, and it's just for days. Like if you want to experiment with SVG and minor little animation possibilities, uh, CodePen's a great place to find inspiration for stuff like that. Fork it, play with it, steal it. It's all open source. You know, I worked with Chris Gannon. He did one of that, that he's, they, I think he's got a bunch of demos in here. Uh, to deliver me this animation, it was so cool. Was I, he worked in After Effects to start because he was faster and then showed me some demos in After Effects and then we picked a few of them and went with it. And when we finally finished, then he delivered it um, uh, with web. He, did, he rebuilt the kind of the final demo with just SVG in JavaScript and then he, he, you know, so the design of it was all done, you know, obviously in SVG. And then he delivered me an API to the animation. So this thing can do, this animation can do different things. Like it can turn and it can open and it can show a positive state and a negative state. And he would just, he sent me the animation with the API. Be like, just call lock.turn and it will turn once. Or call lock.open. I was like, that's such a cool deliverable. Not just an animation, but an animation with its own API. So this is how it worked. And I, I wired up. Uh, you know, key up or key down or whatever to turn. And then if it was the wrong password, it triggered the fail state. If it was the correct password, it triggers the positive state. And, you know, so that I was able to use the animation that he delivered however I wanted to, however it made sense to integrate it into the app. We haven't actually done that yet, but it's coming soon. This is one that, you know, the clouds are moving statically and his tie is shape morphing and his hair is rotating and the you know the fire is is a just scale it looks like and then you know his movement is on a path that's tied to scroll there's a lot going on here that i think is kind of cool all the most fun animations kind of combine lots of stuff together i love that this is an interface that uh, you can record a little audio thing on, and the way that they describe the waveform is just through little rectangles on there, because they thought SVG is a really fast, efficient way to render something like that based on the data that they had. Here's a little kind of a fake amp, you know, equalizer or whatever that kind of draws itself based on input type range equals things that you move around. And it's got nice little shadows and presets and stuff. It's kind of a nice use case for for SVG. This is a friend and coworker of mine, Jake Elba, who made this interface for kind of to make music. So it's called a musical chord arpeggiator. So an arpeggio in music's like, you know, all like a, you know, you're on guitar and you just play a G chord or whatever. An arpeggio of that is all the notes that make up that chord, but played individually. So an arpeggio is do 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 do, you know. Uh, but they can be played in different orders. So that's what all those squiggly little lines there are down at the bottom is what order do you want this chord arpeggio to be played in? And you can see the numbers at the top there, which explains that well enough. Zero, five, three, two, one, fine. But it's more fun to kind of chart it out. I think you can kind of understand what arpeggio is doing when you can look at that. And that's a polyline in SVG. It was really clever. He just made a tiny little coordinate system and drew drew the thing. So you can see that in the web inspector there, that's how he drew those little shapes. And you just apply you know, a little rounding to the outsides of it, which is just a, a CSS feature. Here's it rendered really big. You know, Even if you have a tiny coordinate system, of course, in SVG, you can still draw things really big, round everything with the line cap and the line join. And it's just, it was a really neat use case for SVG, I thought, as part of an interface. And I won't leave you hanging here. This is how it uh, how it goes. You pick like a key and how fast you want it to go uh, and what, you know, major, minor, whatever, and you just play. Everything you do makes you sound awesome on it. Just touch anything. How about a little SVG plus deep purple? Yeah. There's like a weird subculture of SVG and web audio API stuff on CodePen. Like this, like, I'm gonna wire up drum sounds to buckets and my keyboard. 
That's a web audio API, but why not? They took the time to wire it up to an SVG landscape of drums, which is so cool. Hopefully that sparks some ideas. How about icon systems? That's probably one of the top uses for SVG out there on the web. Always ask questions about those. Uh, might be one part of the book I'd change, actually, a little bit, because I, I think I've um, you know, stumbled upon a simpler kind of way to do it. What's the point of an icon system? You, you don't need one to put icons on a website. You can do whatever you want. I've seen plenty of websites, though, that, uh, uh, that, do, that certainly take do whatever you want to the extreme, I think. And the, the point of doing it traditionally has been performance. Let's say you got 50 icons on a page. That's a lot, 20, whatever. Instead of in 20 individual IMG requests, which is typically bad for performance, uh, you know, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, uh, you can smash them all into one request. So an icon system was usually a way to combine requests and to provide some consistency, right? Like if we say, this is how we do icons on this site, then it will breed consistency throughout the app, which is great. And hopefully it's kind of easy. Hopefully there's a pattern. Hopefully there's some copy and paste code in your design library or whatever. So for a long time, I thought this was just the bee's knees coolest way ever to do an icon system, and it still works, and it's fine. If everybody uses this pattern, I think it's perfectly fine. I just think it could possibly be a little easier. All, all icon systems generally start with, in your project, a folder full of SVGs, and you either use them directly or some kind of processing happens to them in which to use them. Uh, so many icon systems work this way, Grunticon and whatever else. But you'd use some kind of build tool to take that folder full of individual SVG files, and in this case, one of the things you can do with them is turn them into one file called like sprite.svg or something that is symbol, 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 symbol. Symbol is an SVG element in which that doesn't draw anything by itself, but is intentionally like, I am intended to be cloned elsewhere. But elsewhere, you could, you could clone that symbol so you could use the same icon over and over, whatever. It was basically a sprite for your SVG symbols. And then you'd use it like this. Any, you'd inject that big chunk of symbols somewhere in your document, anywhere you wanted to actually draw the icon. You'd use the use tag and reference the icon there, and it would draw that icon there, which is a pretty cool pattern, uh, I think. And I use it. You know, here's here's that kind of used to, system being used on CodePen and Trulia. There's plenty of sites that are kind of using that use pattern uh, for icons. It can be. Uh, quite efficient. I think the one thing I would change, though, is that like maybe screw the use system, and like, there's a, a pretty like really simple way to do this. It requires no build step and just really simple old school web anything, which is just include it. The, remember, one of the first slides we looked at was just take some inline SVG and put it in the HTML and it'll draw it. Just do that for your icon system. However you want to do it, you're working it on a WordPress site or a PHP or something, just, you got your folder full of icons already, just include it. You're working on a React site or whatever, just have some code ready that just injects it as a, as a component, or there's a Rails partial there, some C Sharp or whatever. And I just think that's getting more and more popular. There's GitHub and Lonely Planet who are using that system. Just put the thing in place. And if you just put the thing in place, it can't fail, it's super fast, you have control over it with CSS because you just select the thing and style it, you have really clear JavaScript access, just query selector for it and you can get it. There's nothing, there's no weird problems and there's not that many problems with the, 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 the symbol way but it, it is a little bit, it forms this thing called the shadow DOM which is weird and outside of the scope of this talk but if you're looking at the advantages of an SVG icon system, there are many. It's a wonderful way to do an icon system, and it's so damn easy if you just include them where they need to go. Here's an example of that. I'm just dropping some inline SVG in there. Now look at all this control I have. It's an eyeball. I can, uh, I can select the outside of that eyeball and change its color and change its rotation. I can control those in the individual parts of it separately, which is a kind of a a nice little bonus for using an SVG icon system because it something an icon font can't really do. You know, it's like one color or nothing. I can add strokes to it. I can animate it and stuff. Oh, there's all kinds of interesting things you can do if you, uh, in the world of inline SVG. Requires no build step. All the all the control you need. No shadow DOM. No cross browser problems. It's just I think it's a nice way to go, really. And it's kind of like prep for HTTP2, which was mentioned a little bit. You know, HTTPS required and all that stuff. But it kind of throws a wrench in I think this whole icon system, in which that it's not really a penalty anymore to make more requests. Like if every single 
icon on your page of those 20 icons we talked about was an individual IMG tag. In a perfect HTTP world, TP2 world, there really is no penalty for doing that. In fact, it might actually be good because then uh, you know, like you can change one of them without breaking the cache on all other 19 of them or whatever. But okay, so look, we're, if we went this route of just including all of the individual icons, it would just be like SVG, SVG, SVG everywhere. You know, sites like GitHub use the crap out of icons. They're all over the place. They need some kind of icon system for that. They're just in they're just inlining SVGs everywhere right now. Perfectly good system. But maybe in the future, it's more like. Individual image tags everywhere. Image, 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 image. It might be fine in the future. I don't know. I wouldn't do it tonight. <laughs> but just because we're at a conference and talking about stuff like that, maybe it's good to know. Let's do, do some more stuff. Here's a reason to use SVG, just to express yourself. Just why not? It's a great, it's an artistic format. You can draw stuff. It's beautiful. Here's a Sir John Nerdmanship doing a little BB-8. Why not? That's awesome. Yay. Look at him go. It just gets randomized from there. He's just on the run. I think these flames are really nice. Ain't nobody getting paid for this. He just wanted, <laughs> he just wanted to make some flames. That's the, kind of the fun stuff that happens on CodePen that I love. Here's Sarah Drazer made Mr. Potato Head. I did this in Europe once. I'm like, do you have Mr. Potato Head over here? It's a potato head. <laughs> it's not hard to understand. I think you'll get it. I loved this demo from David Corshed, who like made this little husky buddy. He's got a little tongue that you'll see in a minute. Yeah. But it's all Dr. Cat's out. Remember that? Where it's like squiggle vision? That's really cool. It's like there's this thing, and there's SVG filters, which is a whole nother world. But one of them is called a turbulence filter. And you can apply it even to divs and stuff, because that's just how SVG works. It kind of crosses worlds like that a little bit. But you can apply it to SVG elements as well, and it like really tweaks the crap out of an element. It'll be like, Bleh. but if you just tweak it, just use the turbulence filter like 0 .001 or whatever, it just like screws up the edges of it a little bit. And that's fine, but what he did is he used like 0 .001 and 0 .002 and 0 .003, and then used a keyframe animation to swap out that filter rapidly, so it like uses a slightly different turbulence filter over and over and over. Like, what a cool little idea, you know? That's the same kind of turbulence filter applied to these random bubbles. Bubbles floating around a screen is cool anyway. Nice screensaver, you know? But the turbulence really makes that demo, I think. Here's turbulence applied with a path. So this is just a static JPEG, and they used an SVG clipping path, which is just a way to kind of like vector outline a shape and say, only apply this to this area. And they applied a turbulence filter just to the water. It looks like friggin' real water. What a cool idea. I love it. This is, you know, this just makes art. You just like give it a JPEG and it just, you just becomes cubism. You'd be like a famous artist if you invented this in like 1917 or whatever. You could just crank, you'd be the most prolific artist ever. You'd just be sh shipping JPEGs. I don't know. Like, this just like looks amazing. You know, you're like, wow, polygon explosion art. There's hardly anything to it. It's just like query selector all, all polygons. R randomly generate X, Y coordinate that's not in the middle. Uh, animate. <laughs> you know, it looks amazing, but it's like not much code to make something that that's cool, I think. Art is great. You know, I tried to drive this point home over and over, is that like combining ideas is what makes it fun. Sarah Dresner animated this CSS Tricks logo a while back that was like, had this little toggle that was like a timeline that it utilizes opacity changes and line drawing and shape morphing and all that kind of stuff. Should I do it again? Animating on a path. All kinds of stuff combined is what made that so fun, I think. How about diagrams? I mean, we already looked at charts and graphs a little bit, but here's Nadia Bremer who like charted um, gold medal winners for like over 100 years, and that's just a great way to show that data and discover trends in that data that you maybe couldn't have seen and call out interesting things in there. You could zoom in on it really close to get even closer data. It has hovers and stuff to expose that data. Great. She got you know, kind of partner in crime, Shirley Wu, who like took IMDB data and made unique time stamps for every movie based on the, the petal of the flowers, what rating the movie had, and how many petals it had is how many 
like votes or views or whatever it had and stuff. It gave every movie a unique kind of color and shape. What a clever idea. It's all SVG, of course. This is the kind of thing that I really dig, though, as a fellow blogger myself. This is Jake Archibald's blog, and he had a piece of code in there that he wanted to explain through a diagram. He wanted to point to individual pieces of that code and say, here's what's going on with that piece of code. And so you could have just used pre-encode tags and just used like code commenting to point out lines, but he wanted to do something a little bit more fun and arrows and just have it be more emphatic in there. So that's great. So if he made that choice, he might say, fine, I have to make this choice, so I'm just going to make it a PNG or whatever, and maybe I'll have really good alt text that explains it or something or, or whatever. But he didn't have to make that compromise. It's the best of both worlds. That is regular text. It's selectable. It's searchable. It's SEO friendly. It's all that stuff. It's set in SVG. So you can see me selecting it. Orange is just the color I have my text selection color on my computer. I can copy that and paste it, and it's legit code in uh, any other browser. Here's me just like web inspecting and going in there to, I mean, just to kind of prove that I can change these values, and it's regular just text in there. You can see the, all these T-span elements. That's what SVG uses to like move things around, but still have it be real text. Super cool. Not only that, well, maybe I resize it in this video, but we'll see that in a minute, is that SVG kind of has this locked-in size that can be really useful for that. I try to <coughs> steal that idea and use it. This is a blog post on CSS Tricks where I do that, where it looks like but maybe that's just one image, but it's not. It's just an SVG, it's inline SVG in there used to kind of prove a point in a blog post. So here's just like a just kindergartner level design, right, where I set some type and I took this word Graves and I put it in between the M and the T in Graves Mountain, which is something you just don't see that often in web text because you'd have to like use absolute positioning to put it in there and it's finicky and it's like what if, you know, the global document text size changes, things could run into each other and stuff and it's just not something you see in graphic design all that often. And it's, but it's using web fonts, and I can do that in SVG, in inline SVG, and know that it's going to be like sized safely. So check out this demo. If I change the size of it, it keeps that perfect aspect ratio like you'd expect a JPEG to, but it's not a JPEG. It's text. It's selectable, searchable, findable text, which is cool. That kind of ad made me think about, you know, why are ads, like nobody loves ads or whatever, but ads like this are often like little iframes with movies in them or animated GIFs or anything. SVG is kind of perfect for that world too. So if you happen to be in that world, God, SVG is just kind of, kind of wonderful for that. A little self-contained unit that's animated and has links and is accessible and all that kind of stuff. So thinking of those headline lockups for a minute, stuff like Stuff like this is so cool, you know? It's in galleries all over, the, you know, or like inspiration galleries, you see stuff like this. I remember looking at little demos like this and feeling like, I could do that. I love stuff like that. This makes me want to be a designer seeing stuff like that. Then you get to the web and you're like, no, we don't do that ever. That's not like a thing you do on the web. But it can be now, I think, if we kind of embrace this idea of setting text in SVG, I think we can do stuff like that. It comes from like letterpress days where you'd literally take wood type and set it up, sub, upside down and backwards and set it into a chase and then literally lock it down with clamps. That's where the lockup word comes from a little bit. Once it's locked in there, it ain't going anywhere, you know? So what does a lockup look like on the web? Well, you could do it in something like Illustrator. You could have a font, and you see, I, this is Roboto, so I just like grabbed it off Google Fonts, set this thing, which you'd never try to replicate with just like spans and H1s and crap, or if you did, it would be fragile and bleh. But in this case, I'm just, I just did it in Illustrator, and I set it just so, just how I liked it, and then export it, or just copied and pasted it into CodePen here, so I have this, you know, the text, and I didn't convert to outlines or anything, I just let the SVG be the SVG. Uh, and now I have this, like, lockup. I have this set of text that's selectable and accessible and all that stuff, but doesn't move. But I did put a media query in there, so it's not like you have no control. I still have a little media query that, like, moves some things down, and so I still have some control if I want it. I think that's cool. I'd like to see more of that kind of thing be used on the web, I think. Yeah, toolbox, muscle memory, cool. Here's SVG like making its way into, into reality a little bit. Like we got a preview of it when I showed you that letterpress image there. This is a teacher that has found this like epilogue laser machine that basically takes SVG input. That's me liking that tweet, boom. 
Boom, SVG for days. This machine takes vector data and it like carves it out of wood and different types of metals and stuff. So her students were messing around on Inkscape. Inkscape is like free SVG, open source editing software, at least, or a can do vector anyway. And the kids are like making wolves and making unicorns on other unicorns and foxes on other foxes and stuff. I just think that's fun. That, like that, that like the, the idea of vector data is that like real world machinery takes it because it's an open standard format that of course they should take. <clears throat> this is a website for CSS Comp that had these weird blobby shapes. You can kind of see them slowly morphing as they move, and they are all responsive designed up and stuff. It was kind of a lovely looking site, but aside from the design itself, I think I even web inspect so you can kind of see how. This was being animated with a library, and if you, if you go in and find one of the shapes, you can see the path data being rapidly changed in the DOM. I think it's sometimes interesting to watch. Where is it? So some library is like morphing the crap out of that thing. <clears throat> anyway, they had a robot there that would take SVG data and take the, so the shapes that they drew for the website and like shoot ink out of a little gun onto this piece of paper, which I think is pretty darn cool. It's just another place where SVG, like you know, an open format like SVG can power this little robot. Why can't you just print it out on a regular printer? Well, you get like IRL blend modes with this robot. You know, it's like literally ink sitting on top of other ink, which is not something your home laser jet kind of thing can do. Sweet. So this is setting metal type. It's similar to wood type, you know? It's just little blocks of, of metal type you set upside down and backwards and make a poem or whatever. I kind of picked it up as a hobby a few years ago because there happened to be a shop in my neighborhood, but that's great. You can walk into a shop, you can set a paragraph, you can pull it on a machine, and you can walk out of there with a print, and it's very satisfying. But sometimes we want to like combine our digital lives and letterpress too. I still want to letterpress the thing, but I want it to be my design. I want to build something that I did in Illustrator. Well, there's this company called Boxcar Press that makes these polymer plates that work on, you know, they have a whole system for letterpressing with it, but you send them a design, guess what format, and they send you back a piece of polymer plate like that. And it's cheap and inexpensive and fast. And here's an example of it. You get this sticky polymer thing that you put on this piece of metal, and then you can pull it in a letterpress press, really, of any kind. So I was playing around with this one night. I morphed a heart, a code pen, the outside of the code pen shape to a heart, and I wired up this little thing so I could stop the morphing halfway in between. And I'd stop the morphing, go into the DOM, <laughs> take the path data, save it to a file, and open it in Illustrator so I could get that shape into Illustrator so that I could like make a file of, of, of like a stopped morph. You know, and then I took that SVG data and I sent it to Boxcar Press and they sent me back that polymer plate and I set it on their metal thing and then I inked up the roller, which is red and black there you can see. When that spins up, it kind of makes a gradient on the rollers. And I put some paper in there and pulled my prints and now I have these like kind of cute little prints for my house, which is like a code pen logo to a heart. That's me pulling it. And that's kind of how they turned out. Which was fun. I just, you know, SVG was kind of a part of the process of this very like real life thing, which is cool. So oh, here's number ten. Here's just another add-on kind of thing. Here's a this I found this on like a site that like sells a WordPress theme that had this sticky sidebar kind of thing, and they're using it as marketing to sell their their theme. And the the developer was so excited. They're like, look, you can apply CSS to this running animation live, like it doesn't stop the animation or anything. It just kind of was driving home to that particular developer was excited about this idea that you have this animation that's like touchable at any time from CSS, which is neat. DigitalOcean uses a lot of SVG in their kind of marketing stuff to explain what they do. These are dots going up a hill. Apparently they do that. This is trying to explain a droplet, I guess. This, this is all very cool design work, I think. They, they do a good job of it. Put your code in a droplet. It connects to other droplets. It's a cool way to work. This is their animation for global thermonuclear war. <laughs> or a CDN, one of the two, I think. This is, explains how a, a gear differential works by just JavaScripting up some SVG circles and doing some math on the back end, what a kind of a cool way to demonstrate that concept, I think. If you've ever sent something in MailChimp, you've seen a little SVG animation, because 
Freddie gives you a nice solid little high five there on your way out, which you can just, that flash is a nice touch, right? I feel like you can feel it. Boom. There's a publication called Bustle uh, that does these like interactive, clicky, I don't know, you know, make a choice and then it zooms you to your next choice, like choose your own adventure kind of graphics. These are designed as like a massive illustrator, I think. I've never like met the designer of these, but I'm pretty sure this is how it works. It's one giant piece of SVG that's all designed. And then like what they do is, you remember that view box attribute, 0, 0, 100, 100 or whatever? That's just like, you can think of that almost as like a camera looking down at SVG. Like this is the coordinate system that I want to be looking at this piece of SVG right now. But it doesn't have to be all of your SVG. In fact, it could just be a little bit of it. And because it's just some numbers, it can be animated. So you can animate the view box, which is just a really tricky thing. So here's how this works, just real quick. Here's the, the canvas, and it has that view box, let's say. And you draw a circle inside of that view box. That's the camera, OK? And let's say we change that view box to totally different numbers. That's what's happening there instead. But the, uh, the changing the view box doesn't actually change the size of the element. So the element stays the same size, and what actually happens is the camera's looking at it, and that's what happens. It's this weird kind of thing. So it enables this ability of being able to zoom around a larger document, uh, thinking of the view box kind of as a, as, a, as a camera, which is lovely, I think. This is a demo that uses that. It like zooms into this island and moves around and uh, uses that technique a little bit. I think it's. A little underused a little bit. I mean, it's just, I think it opens up people's minds into thinking about that stuff a little bit. That's a really long demo, and we're coming up at the end of the day, so remember about the mandatory book purchase. <laughs> just kidding, but not really. And thanks so much for having me at Event Depart. It's been fantastic. <laughs>